every Sunday, we give you the stories you need to know in the week ahead. But tonight, we're taking it a step further. We've asked three top journalists to give us their top 10 stories coming down the pipe in the next year. We're joined now by Marnie Supkoff. She's blogs editor for Huffington Post Canada. John Cruikshank, president and publisher of the Toronto Star. And Jonathan Gatehouse, senior correspondent with Maclean's magazine. So here we go. Big story number 10 for 2013. Okay. The future the of the BlackBerry. So you guys are all rooting for RIM, but not too optimistic. <laughs> Number nine, you picked extreme weather. Hurricane Sandy got everyone talking about climate change again. But according to you guys, it may have to get even worse before people really pay attention. So now your pick for number eight. In April, the Liberals will elect their leader, and a lot of people are talking about the kid with the name. I need your help, and tonight I'm here to ask you for it. Are you guys ready? So, is Justin Trudeau the one to pull the Liberals out of their funk? What do you think, John? Well, first of all, will he win the race? Yes, I think he will win the race, almost certainly. Um, but picking a leader doesn't renew the party. Um, however, I think he has enough, enough energy, enough youth, um, enough enthusiasm uh, to begin that process. Well, it was funny because journalists seem to be speaking of him sort of condescendingly, but I think you've noticed a bit of a shift. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's beginning to happen. He's, he's, he's someone who grew up with the experience of Canadian politics that the rest of us can only imagine. What do you think, Jonathan? Well, you know, I think it's always fatal in politics to underestimate someone, and Justin is frequently underestimated. You know, he's smarter than people give him credit for. He's more of a political animal than people give him credit for. But what he's inheriting is a third party that's in a distant third place. Hmm. So is there a race there, Marty, and uh, can he make a difference if he wins it? I don't think there's much of a race. I, I think it's pretty much his to lose, unless he does something really crazy. I think it's his. But I think once that race is over, it's a really steep uphill climb. And I, I'm not sure he's going to have what it takes to get there. To take on Stephen Harper. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> let's take uh, on big story number seven. And I believe that faced with a clear red line, Iran will back down. Last year, Israel's Prime Minister gave Iran an ultimatum, but so far, Iran isn't backing down on its nuclear program. Sooner or later, Israel and the U.S. may make good on those threats. So is 2013 the year they bomb Iran? Jonathan, I'll, I'll start with you. I don't think so. I Listen, I think the U.S. has had more than a belly full of problems in the Middle East, plenty of wars with Afghanistan and Iraq. They're not eager to start a third one. Had it been Mitt Romney who won the presidency? This might have changed things, but Obama is inclined to uh, go for another crack at diplomacy. What do you think, John? I think Obama has a lot more leverage now, uh, having been re-elected uh, into the second term. I also think that Obama is going to begin the process of, of um, taking the, the, the devilment out of the process of dealing with Iran. Um, it's not part of an axis of evil. It's another country that has particular interests. It's a long-standing civilization. It's a bad regime, and extending the franchise is bad, but, you know, this can be dealt with diplomatically. So that sounds like two no's. What do you think, Marty? <laughs> I think there's a good chance of a yes. I think he will do everything he can not to have to, and I think he really doesn't want to have to, but I think he might have to. I, I mean, I think to the extent that he can avoid, um, it's a huge action to take, to the, to the extent he can sort of contain it to one action and not make it a step towards a full-out war, I think he will do it all in his power to do that. But I think he's running out of options. All right, time to move on to our next big story, number six. And we know in our hearts that for the United States of America, the best is yet to come. For U.S. President Barack Obama, it's four more years. In 2013, will Obama break through the Washington gridlock or be a president paralyzed? What do you think, Barney? <laughs> well, I think he, he does have a chance to break through the gridlock because of something awful that happened. I think he has now, after the Sandy Hook shooting, he's made uh, gun control. Uh, he's offered a renewed commitment to actually make something happen there. Do you think that momentum will carry on? I think it might. I mean, it was such a traumatic and uh, it's one of those events that just sort of hit people in the gut on a sort of human level. And uh, those are the kind of kicks in the behind that you actually need to get something through. And he certainly has made it clear that he intends to do that, to, to try to capitalize on that uh, momentum. What do you think, John? 
He's beholden to no one at this point. It's a wonderful situation for a second-term president. He's beholden to no one in his party and no one in the other party. Um, so he can, he can actually deal. He can actually deal in a realistic way for the benefit of all. And I think he's capable of doing that. Um, I mean, interestingly, Bill Clinton what? had a very productive second term, yeah. much more so than the first. So uh, where will he move? In which areas? I, th I think, listen, I think, that, I think the major focus has still got to be uh, dealing with the problems of the economy, dealing with the credit problem in the United States, and dealing with unemployment, especially among young people. What do you think, Jonathan? Well, you know, I think we're starting to see signs that the economy is bouncing back in the United States. That's only going to strengthen his hand. I do believe that you're going to see an Obama that looks a lot more like people hoped he was going to look like in 2008. But the one thing that we've understood about Obama and we've learned is that he's more of a conciliator than people ever thought he would be. And so decisive action, maybe not so much. Story number five. The NHL, if it's there, it's there. We'll watch it sometimes, maybe. The hockey season may have been saved, but some fans won't forget the 500-plus games lost during this lockout in their battle over NHL profits. Did the league and the players damage the sport. Jonathan, I'm going to start with you because you wrote a book about Batman, and we heard earlier in the show that Don Cherry was saying that Batman's the hero here. What do you think? Well, listen, I think most fans know who the villain is, and their villain is Gary Batman. He's not the hero. He's the guy who locked everybody out. This didn't have to happen. It happened because the owners wanted it to happen. They saw what happened in the NBA lockout last year and the NFL lockout where the players ended up with a reduced share of revenue, 50-50 split. This is what Bettman's achieved with the NHL. In some ways, it's a victory for him, but obviously it comes with a lot of collateral damage. In terms of damage, Marty, what do you expect? Will fans forgive them and just go back? Some will, particularly the, the ones around us here in Canada, but I think in the southern markets in particular, those are pretty fragile markets to begin with. I think those fans might just say, oh, what's, forget it, what's the use? Uh, so I think there is damage done, and I think it'll take some time to get those people back. Who do you blame, John, and uh, is there damage here? Oh, I, I blame all sides because they're all insufferably wealthy and powerful. Um, but I think the, you know, the boycott by fans in Canada will last just up until the puck drops. Um, whereas, I, I, Marnie's absolutely right, it's, it's going to be a real uphill battle in the, in the South and the West in the United States. Hmm. Yeah, I wish people would stand up and boycott the first few games, but I, I, I don't see it happening either. I actually shouldn't say that you on know. CBC. <laughs> uh, we're going to move on to uh, big story number four. It is the Arab Spring's bitterest fruit. Syria is a land of shattered cities, sectarian strife, and fading hopes. But rebels made steady gains in 2012. Is this the year Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad is driven from power? Jonathan, I'll, I'll start with you again. Mm -hmm. We heard today, it didn't sound today like a man who was about to back off or be intimidated by anyone. Right. I, I, I certainly defiant talk from Bashar al-Assad, but... You know, if you keep in mind, these are the sort of speeches we heard from Omar Gaddafi towards the end, Saddam Hussein towards the end as well. I think he's been greatly weakened. His power base has been greatly weakened. You might see a rump Alawite state along the coast, but I think it's only a matter of time now until he falls. Marty? Yeah, I, I don't think that he can last too much longer. I think, and I, I don't think you can... What, he's not the kind of person who's going to come out and say, well, I guess it's over. That's just not, that's not to be expected. It isn't something we have expected. And there was nothing in his words that was any indication that things will actually change in any way, despite all the promises of reform. So I, it's, it's pretty much business as usual, and I don't think he's got much time left. So if he does go, John, then what? Is this, is this the end of Syria's misery? Oh, uh, but by no means. Um, it's the beginning of a new form of misery. Uh, I think we, we're going to be left with deep, deep sectarian divisions. Um, there will be all kinds of, of poaching and playing by, by Russia, certainly. Um, the West will have its own, own interests uh, to look after. Um, the civil war will continue. This is not simply a war of, against a, a, one dictator. This is, this is a much broader war, and that's why it's been so devastating. All right, time to move on to your pick for story number three. The Idle No More movement has put First Nations issues back in the spotlight. For the old and the young, on the streets and online, it's a call to action. And for many, it's been a political awakening. But will it change anything? 
What do you think, John? Will, will this change things? I think it's going to change public consciousness. Um, it's not clear what the Idle No More movement wants changed, and that's part of the, part of the problem. Um, it, it has very generalized goals, uh, some of which indeed may be met. Uh, that is, if, if, if they can get, get further into the conscience of Canadians. Um, because I think while they're arguing there are constitutional issues that need to be argued, frankly, I don't think that's really what, what, uh, what needs to be gotten at. These are matters of conscience, just as, as you know, the issues of the, of, of the schools were a matter of conscience for Canadians, and they were finally addressed only when, when we were all gripped by that and our own sense of collective responsibility. Marnie? Well, I think one thing it might change, and which it is changing, is is actually having having the people the people who are want to call attention to these issues taking it upon themselves to put the movement forward, and they are actually doing something themselves rather than waiting. I guess it's the whole point of the slogan. Which, um, but I think there is some truth to it, and and the fact that these are people who have been very very savvy with social media, have taken to Facebook, have taken to Twitter, um, they obviously have they know how to tap into to. To young people and to speak to the rest of Canada that way. So yes, I do think something has changed and something will continue to change. Jonathan, I'm going to leave you out here because we're getting close to the end. We're going to move quickly to story number two. I think we'll take it one step at a time. We'll sort of get over the marriage thing first and then maybe look at the kids. During the royal wedding, they basked in the glow of global adoration. And this year, the birth of their child will be a seismic media event. People clearly love everything Will and Kate. But is a royal baby worth all the fuss? Marnie, what do you think? <laughs> well, it's, I don't know if it's worth all the fuss, but it is interesting. I think it's particularly people are particularly interested because the rules of succession, succession have changed. So if this is a girl, it would be very exciting that this, this would be an heir to the throne for the first time. Jonathan, are you all excited? Oh, sure. You couldn't leave me out here. Um, <laughs> Listen, I, I mean, I, I mean, you know, McQueen's. This is part of the franchise. McQueen's is very excited about this. I think people will be excited about this as well. Time for our last story, <laughs> number one. Last year, the U.S. economy saw a weak, fragile recovery. Europe sank into recession, stifled by austerity, drowning in debt. Economists say the only reason things are this good is vast amounts of printed money. So, will this year be the end of the economic crisis, or just another one, Jonathan? I think we're starting to see the beginning of the end, if that's not an entire cop-out, but uh, the job numbers are getting good in the States. The economy and uh, the fundamentals here in Canada remain strong, seem to be getting stronger. Still got big problems in Europe that need to be addressed, but if people can find the will, I think we're starting to climb out. Last quick point, John. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little less sanguine about the situation in the United States. I still think there are challenges, uh, but Canada has outperformed most of the other OECD countries, and that's great. Well, we'll see what comes true. I'm sure uh, our friends at home have other ideas what should have made the top ten, but thank you very much. Of course, this is just our list. Lots more big stories to watch, and of course, lots that will take us by surprise.